Welcome back to r slash neighbors from hell, where people share stories about their crazy neighbors. And if you are new to my channel, please don't forget to subscribe to join our amazing community. And without any further ado, let's dive right into the stories. And the first one is titled, Not All Neighbors Are Mr. Rogers. So growing up, I lived in a house in a quiet small town in California. Our house was a corner house and because of that was one of the biggest lots in the neighborhood and right on the edge of a seasonal river. Having so much space, I had dogs as a kid, normal excitable animals, our dogs barked at strangers. Not excessive barking, but the usual, hey, who are you? Why are you outside my yard? Most of the neighbors had dogs, many of which were small, yappy and obnoxious. Whatever, we made our share of noise, barbecues on the weekends, loud music from time to time. Neighbors made noise, we made noise, nobody complained. My first dog grew old and died. And I got another dog, actually too. I found a pair of twin puppies abandoned in an alley, walking to school one day. Carried them around in my backpack all day. I kept one, gave one to my girlfriend's dad, cute little Queensland slash terrier mutts. Anyways, the new dog had the same political views as the first one and was pretty good at restricting barking to when strangers hung around. We had a good fence and the dogs couldn't get out. Cool beans. So I'm a teenager and the new dog is four years old. We are both pretty set in our routines. Neighbors across the street have medical problems and move out to be closer to family. They rent their house out to first a series of teenagers and short timers and eventually a middle-aged couple. New neighbors are, at first, standard strange new people. We talked with them a few times. The wife described herself as an artist. She created gaudy yard sculptures and made attempts at landscape design. She was way off planting things like poison oak and nettles because they were naturally growing in the river and added a California ambience to her yard. Cool. The plants ran rampant, took over her yard and overgrew the sidewalks around her house which many many families used for afternoon walks. Good times. After a while, maybe two months or so, she started complaining about our dog barking. First she would just walk across the street and admonish us for having pets that interrupted her creative moods. This escalated to phone calls and complaints to the police. Mind you, our dog barked about twice a day most days, though he really got excited when the trash truck came by. He loved to run back and forth across the yard yelling at it. One day he actually caught it, escaped out an open gate, tore ass down the street to catch it and plowed right into the back when it stopped. We never did get a ticket, the cops got to the point where they stopped responding to her. She was furious about this and came over to our house several times to scream at my parents about the dogs. My mom was fed up with her and decided it was time to take this further. Neighbor asked, if I buy one of those electric collars, do you think it would work? My mom responds, I don't know, would you wear it? Her screaming fits were met with first ironic responses and then loud music with the stadium speakers pointed at her house, etc. Then she bought the statue. She must have found it at an estate sale, this huge jockey statue that she thought was the bee's knees. She bought it, spent the week very carefully painting it white and proudly displayed it in her front yard. Around this time the fights over our quasi noisy dog had reached a climax and one day I came home to find my dog very sick. He died at the vet's office and the vet informed us the dog had ingested a very large quantity of rat poison which we don't have or use. Of course we suspected the neighbor she smirked at us from her yard when we got home but couldn't prove anything and the police couldn't do anything, no evidence, no witness, nothing. So late one night after a month of no complaints I snuck over to the neighbor's house at my mom's urging and a couple friends and I confiscated her 400 pound concrete statue. Snuck it back to our house, stripped off the recent coats of paint and lo and behold the jockey was restored to its original racist black color. Snuck back across the street and left the statue on the sidewalk several houses away from the neighbor. Come the next morning the good neighbors all noticed there is this horrible racist statue with a hobo stick propped in its arms, a runaway note taped to its chest, escaping from its owner. 
Neighbor's husband is not strong enough to move it back home, so gets on his bike and takes off before his wife wakes up. Somebody called the police, complained about a racist art display and they come talk to the neighbor. Surprise, surprise, they look in her backyard as they talk things over and notice an owl propped on a tree to scare away crows that looks a bit off. They inspect, talk to her some more and leave with her in custody. Turns out she had shot and killed an endangered owl, hung it with chicken wire on a tree and now had a federal charge against her. All because my dog barked a couple times a day. And guys, wow, I gotta say, that story went from zero to absolutely 360. If you enjoy the neighbor stories that I read very frequently now, please don't forget to post some star emojis in the comments. Thank you so much in advance. And the next one is titled, park in my driveway and then blatantly ignore me when I show up. Enjoy not sleeping tonight. Background, I live in condos that have attached garages and each unit's garage door and driveway is right next to each other. This is nice because it was hard to find a condo with an attached garage in this area but comes at the cost of the bedroom of some units being directly above a neighbor's garage. I am one of those garages and as such take care to be quick and reasonably quiet whenever I come and leave late at night, although some is of course not reasonably avoidable. Mostly, I just drive my truck instead if it is late because it is parked outside on the street so I can come and leave quietly without my garage door opener shaking my neighbor's bedroom. Today it is the early evening and I leave for a short trip in town. I see my next door neighbor talking in Russian with her family in her driveway right next to mine, a common occurrence, a bit odd but I don't mind. I come back 20 minutes later and find that another one of her family cars has parked in my driveway, fully blocking my garage door despite her driveway being extra wide and unit. Now there are also four people out there standing around and loading something into the trunk. I pull up and wait for them to see me and move out of the way, but nothing. They know my car, it is very distinctive and they can hear it, but I now also put on my left blinker to politely indicate that I intend to go into my garage. Still nothing. They are slowly walking and loading stuff into the trunk of the car and I am fully in their view. But it is like they are making an effort to look elsewhere and not acknowledge me. I yell out the window, excuse me, and they ignore it. I yell again louder, excuse me, and they turn their backs and ignore me again. Wow, there's about 10 ways they know I am there and what I want by now, but each one of them refuses to even acknowledge me. Oh, screw you. I apply more than the necessary amount of throttle and go down the street to park, not burning rubber, but enough that it is yet another thing to catch their attention. I get out and walk to my door glaring at them, but they still won't even dare to look at me. They continue to be parked in my driveway for another 15 minutes and finally leave. Tonight it is now 10.45 pm and I've been making a point to no longer limit my garage noise. It is still a bit early in the night, but I've already completed my noise garage projects, drilling and hammering, that I had previously intended to save for a reasonable hour during the day tomorrow and of course I have opened and shut the garage garage door a few times, mildly slammed a few doors, etc. I have also decided that I should go ahead and finally go see the late showing of World War Z tonight, so I'll be leaving for that in about 15 minutes. And of course, I will be driving my car that is now parked back in the garage. No need to be polite and take my street parked vehicle for the sake of being quiet, I am going to use every luxury and convenience available to me. Come about 1.45 am, jackass neighbor's bedroom will be shaking yet again from me, operating the garage door as I come home. I feel like I might also need to go buy milk at about 3 am. And the next one is titled, cranky old a-hole and the fence he had to pay twice for. One of my former jobs was at a glass installation place. It was a warehouse that contained a small office and a shop slash storage area for the crews. Running along the side of the warehouse was a 12 feet wide grassy area, still our property, and then alongside next to that was a driveway for a small storage facility, about 8 spaces owned by somebody else. We were tight on parking so the owner would use the driveway behind us to access our grassy area. Well. 
one day this old timer came into our lobby, asked for the owner and then told him he didn't want him using the driveway to access his parking spot on our own property. Now mind you, my boss never blocked anybody and also sometimes renters would come over to us and ask to use our restroom, which we always let them. Sometimes they would even temporarily park on our grass strip while they unloaded and we never made a stink about that. Well, Mr. Cranky was having none of it, my boss even asked him nicely and got shut down. So to be a dick, Mr. Cranky decided to have a chain link fence installed right where our grassy area meets his driveway, so a crew comes out and started driving posts into the ground. Well, where they were driving the posts was on our property. I went and alerted the boss, he went and had a look and then said, I'm going to wait until they are done first. When they finished the post and were getting ready to add the chain link part, the boss went out, told them to stop and then explained that they were on our property while he had a copy of the property survey for proof. The old man was there, tried to take a look at the survey, my boss snatched it away from him and said, get your own survey. So Mr. Cranky had to pay extra for a surveyor to come out, at least $400, only to find out that his new fence was on our property. Then he had to pay to have the new fence removed and then have holes drilled in his asphalt driveway for the posts and then pay for labor all over again to get his fence reinstalled. Between the survey and having to pay for dismantling and reinstalling his new fence, I am sure he was out a few bucks. Take that, you old fart. And by the way, ripe stars, I would just like to remind you once again, if you have especially any interesting neighbor stories to share, please feel free to post them on r slash ripe stories on Reddit, which is our own subreddit. If you are curious on how to register on Reddit, because you have to register in order to post, you can essentially just input any email, it does not even have to be a valid one, and then just any password. Afterwards, you can just start posting on r slash ripe stories if you want. And the next one is titled, Petty Revenge Never Felt More Satisfying. This revenge happened a few years ago, but I was reminded of it today and thought I would share it with you wonderful people. I was in my very early 20s and working at a retail store and used to take my breaks away from the store for multiple reasons. On this day I decided to eat at the lake which is 100% public property throughout the park, I bought a wrap from a nearby store and drove to the lake. I sat down at the picnic tables that were nearby, a french fried truck. While I was eating my wrap, some a-hole seagull got very bold and dive bombed my wrap while it was sitting in front of me on the table. As this made a mess, I went and asked the chip truck guy if I could have a couple napkins and he exclaimed that they were for chip truck customers only. I explained that I'm a customer, just not today, and that his attitude will only make me not ever want to eat there in the future again. He gave me a stupid look and didn't say anything, so I went back to the table and cleaned up the mess the best I could. As I was walking back to my car, I went to place the garbage in the bin near his chip truck. He literally came out of the truck and yelled at me, saying the garbage can is for customers only and the picnic tables, public property, were also for his customers only only. Now there must have been 25 seagulls lurking around me in hopes of getting their beak wet with my tasty wrap. So I went back to the picnic tables which he claimed were his and threw the remnants of my wrap up in the air so that crap went everywhere. The seagulls went crazy and him and his little want of a girlfriend came running out of the truck following me as I walked to my car and took pictures of my license plate. At this point I thought my petty revenge was over and I was pleased with the result as I'm sure I had inconvenienced them more than they had me, but two days later a cop shows up at my door saying that they received a complaint that I was vandalizing public property. I explained to the cop what had happened and he told me that I shouldn't have done what I did, but that the chip truck is not allowed to claim public property as their own and the next time I went to the lake there was no more chip truck. And the next one was posted on r slash ripe stories by user drtimefox and it is titled Steal my bowling meat for a cash grab? Members revenge. Back in 2016 I created a bowling meet for those like me with few friends and little cash together just to have fun. 
The real truth is I was one of them and after two months people started to come. I often paid for food and the $7 it cost to bowl and frankly I didn't care how much it cost me, the only pleasure I took was the fact I was not alone. It started out small, but by December 2017, when these events took place, we had over 40 people and me having to help out with the costs pretty much stopped by then. Enter Dave and Karen, not their real names. They came to my meet around April of 2017. Dave often helped me out with prizes and tickets for free drawings. While Karen was a talented artist, often gave away her work as prizes and would create badges for our meet. I thought all was going well until mid-December 2017 when I suddenly became very seriously ill. I would be constantly in and out of the hospital for the next three and a half months before I fully recovered. I still think of asking Dave and Karen to take over my meat temporarily until I fully recovered, but that was the biggest mistake I could make. I know now I should have just suspended it. Dave and Karen would run my meet that January, they told me it was a disaster and they both tried to convince me to end it. I hoped that I would be better for the February meet, okay I admit I was an optimist, but my health did not get better. Around this same time I was contacted by Trixie, not her real name, on Facebook about creating a committee to run my meet. That we are joined by her friends Sally and James, also not their real names, and together we would make things better and correct the problems. It was when I agreed that they clearly took advantage of me and my condition. This was when on this one group on Facebook we all belonged. There I saw this poster which stated my meat was now a mini con and they were charging people $22 to go bowling and $9 just to hang out with them. They claimed any profits would go to a local animal charity and to this date no one has ever seen proof that ever happened. When I saw this I lashed out even more so after I suddenly found myself banned from my own meat. Worse yet, this is when I found out that Trixie, Sally and James were teenagers and friends of both Dave and Karen. On top of that, it seems the admins of the three groups on Facebook where I advertised my meat and this new one blocked me. Later I learned that everything both Dave and Karen told me was lies and that they started to charge everyone to be there in January and not February. Now here is where the revenge kicks in, both Dave and Karen made certain promises, like renting out the lounge for everyone and providing food. But strangely enough they turned the meat over to James, yes the same James I mentioned earlier, but when the truth got out about his real age, he was the first of four that would be placed in charge. But that was not their only problem, the lounge it seems was rarely rented out. Food became more attempts at McDonald's even though the bowling center does not allow outside food and money to the charity. The only one claim of a donation was ever made and that was on Twitter with no proof to back that up, not even a fake receipt. Also Dave and Karen told everyone that I was dead. The members felt like they were being ripped off and regularly argued with the meat's host and wound up getting kicked out. I found out from January to May, the total number of regulars went down from 43 to just 17. By that August, Karen had planned a bowling meet combined with a birthday party of her kid. All members of the meet had to provide a present or get kicked out of the meet permanently. I remember a poster for that meet on Twitter and thought it was just about the craziest thing I have ever seen. I will fully admit I saw nothing on social media about that bowling meet after that. By September with my health fully restored, I was ready to face any problems I had with my old meat. I was even willing to pay the bowling center for anything I possibly owed, something Dave told me. But what happened totally surprised me. When I was greeted by high fives from every member of the staff except the manager who actually apologized to me for any misunderstanding. You know, I was even told by an actual member of the bowling center staff, if I took over my meat when it was still there, everything would have been comped. The manager told me karma won, not a single person was there for that August meet. I was also told by the manager that after this, no bowling meets are allowed. Only regular games and league play, it wasn't because Dave and Karen caused any problems, they just didn't want any more problems. And ripe stars, unfortunately we have already reached the end of today's video. I hope you enjoyed the content. However, if you cannot wait for more ripe content, then I suggest you head on over to patreon.com slash ripe YouTube, where you can find more exclusive Reddit content read by me. 
Patreon subscriptions start at just $1 per month and for $1 your name will show up at the end of each of my new videos. However, if you are willing to spend $3 per month, you will get access to more than 50 exclusive Reddit videos, mostly just no mother-in-law stories. However, please understand, I don't want to pressure anyone into spending money, because I am already incredibly grateful that you watch my videos every single day. Thank you so much for your daily support, it really means the world to me, and I hope to see you again tomorrow for the next video.